Hi, I'm Kian O'Carroll, and back in 2018, I met Vicky Phelan when she was looking for a solicitor to help her fight her case. She went on to win that case and uncovered a shocking healthcare scandal that has affected so many women and families across Ireland. We also became friends. Vicky went on to fight one campaign after another for women's healthcare in Ireland, and all the time fighting for her own life, fighting for more time. This is a series of conversations where Vicky and I discuss what went wrong in cervical check, how those fatal and life-changing mistakes happened, and look at what Vicky has achieved since she became an advocate for change. Hello again, I'm Kian O'Carroll and once more I'm in conversation with Vicky Phelan. Good morning, Vicky. Good morning, Kian. When we were last talking, we came to the point of you telling about your research into clinical trials and finding the drug pembrolizumab. And just to quickly uh, overview that, you were saying that you had researched clinical trials for uh, immunotherapy drugs in the United States. You had seen one which looked interesting to you, which was pembrolizumab. You found out that it was manufactured by Mark Sharp and Dome, who have a significant presence in Ireland. Indeed, you would have been driving past their Ballydyne plant yeah. every time you went to, to work in Waterford. Yeah, I know. Um, and, uh, and then you found out from them that one of the doctors they were working closely with in Ireland for pembrolizumab, albeit for other cancers, not cervical mm -hmm. cancer, was Dr. David Fenley. Yeah. So at this point, you had, you, this is all in January of 2018. Yeah. You've met with Dr. Lorraine Walsh, a radiation oncologist. She has sent you for a biopsy. She hasn't any more remedies for you because with recurrence of cancer, the radiation therapy wasn't an option. So she's no. referring you on to a medical oncologist, um, Professor Gupta in Limerick, uh, Rajneesh Gupta, who um, is now about to meet with you. And you go and you, you talk to him on the 28th of January. That's correct, yeah. So I had two weeks from the uh, appointment where I had the, you know, the, the really bad news with Dr. Lorraine Walsh yeah. um, and the appointment then with Dr. Professor Gupta and the biopsy in between, which had confirmed that this was a recurrence and wasn't a new cancer. So I spent those two weeks literally on my laptop researching and researching and researching, trying to find some something to give me a glimmer of hope um, so that I could go into this appointment with Professor Gupta and you know have a couple of names of drugs and you know that I could go and say can I not try this drug or you know can I not I suppose I was so naive in some respects about clinical trials I didn't realize that clinical trials I do now um, have sites you know so if a clinical trial is set up usually it's set up starts in America and they might have sites in Europe Generally, we don't get a lot of sites here in Ireland. You might get one or two for, you know, bigger trials. But generally, you know, most of the trials, you either have to travel to the States or, you know, the nearest then for us here in Ireland would probably be London. You know, so the UK would get far more than we do, obviously. Um, mm -hmm. But at the time, I had no notion that this was, you know, I just thought a clinical trial that, you know, if, it, if a drug was on a clinical trial, that surely it was available in Limerick or Galway or... You know, that's how naive I was, I suppose, at the time. So, I mean, I you know, I was looking up these clinical trials and, you know, once I saw that there was a couple of drugs, I, I was kind of, I suppose, ready to ask Professor Gupta, can I not try this drug? I see it's on a clinical trial, not knowing that that meant that it wouldn't be available kind of, you know, for general cancer populations for another couple of years, really, um, because the whole purpose of clinical trials is to try drugs out before they bring them to market. So, um, uh, the kind you know, of things... Yeah. Mm. Go ahead. The, the kind of things that, that you were interested in trying um, weren't on offer in your local um, oncology centre, which was in University Hospital Limerick. No. So I remember going to that meeting armed with, I remember walking into the appointment. <laughs> I could see his face because I had, you know, wads of paper coming in with me and a notebook and all my questions <laughs> written down, you know. This might take a while. <laughs> yeah, I think he yeah. could see that, you know, and I remember Jim came with me and I, I remember saying to Jim, and I don't know why um, at that stage, but, uh, you know, I, I asked him to, to take notes. I said, in case there's anything that he says, I said, I'm going to be throwing questions at him. I said, so I'm not going to have time to write down whatever he says. So I said, whatever he says, 
you know, you need to take notes because I want to keep asking them questions and, you know, see if there's any other options because I know that they're just going to offer me palliative chemo. Um, so I want to see if there's anything else. So I remember, you know, asking him about pembrolizumab because I knew that at that stage that pembrolizumab was being used in Ireland in, right. you know, a, a number of hospitals. It wasn't in Limerick at that stage, uh, but I didn't know that. Um, and he said, no, unfortunately, that's not available for your cancer. And I said, but it's available for cervical cancer in, in, in the United States. And he said, yes, but it usually takes two or three years, which obviously I've discovered since. Um, you know, once a drug is uh, approved by the FDA in the United States, it takes about two or three years for the uh, European Medical Agency, I think is a medicines agency, the EMA, to approve the drugs for, you know, the same cancers over here. So we're kind of two or three years behind, which is terrible, really. You know, it, it, it's shocking, especially when you're in the situation yourself. And I remember saying to him, I don't have two or three years. You know, that, uh, you know I don't have two or three years. So I said, I want to get on this drug. I said, so, you know, can you not get access to it? And he said, no, um, you know, we, we, all we can offer you here is, is, you know, the Avastin and chemotherapy combination. So at that point, I just said, well, you know, I want to get a referral then to um, this other doctor who I had found out was prescribing pembrolizumab albeit not for cervical cancer, but I thought, you know, that was my best bet. So I got my referral that day to uh, Dr. David Fenley in St. Vincent's Hospital, and, you know, it took a number of weeks before I got access to the drug, but I did get on it in the end. Uh, but I did have to use an awful lot of political influence and making a nuisance of myself with phone calls and calling Mark Sharp and Dome and pestering them and giving them a sub story and asking them could they not make an exception and give me the drug and you know so I, I did what I had to do I think when you're backed into a corner you'll try anything to get access to something to give you more time you know and I heard Dr Fenley a couple of times talking on radio interviews and the like mm. about um, about this process so he he is running or leading a trial in St Vincent's Hospital mm -hmm. and in that he seems to be working then with the manufacturer of the inventor of the drug because they want trials, they want an experiment to prove that the drug works and how it works best and, and, and all of that. Um, so he was then enthusiastic about extending the reach of the drug to cervical cancer, is that it? He was and he wasn't. Um, he, he, he said he would love to offer it to his cervical cancer patients because he thought that it might work and he had mm. seen the results from the you know, very limited study that they had done on, on cervical cancer in America where the FDA had approved it. But his hands were ultimately tied, really. He said, unless the only way um, people can get access to off-label drugs, which is what that would be at that stage because it wasn't prescribed for cervical cancer, usually... Um, it would be at the discretion of the consultant or the clinician. But because I was a public patient, you know, that wasn't going to be available to me as an option. So he said the only way I would be able to get access to the drug was if I paid for it myself mm. and if he made the argument to the hospital board to allow me to try the drug. Um, but he said that they would see it as a huge risk. And I said, well, I'd be willing to sign whatever paperwork was put in front of me just to give me a chance to try the drug. Um, and he did, in fairness to him, he was very upfront about it and said, you know, this is a ex very expensive drug. You know, it'll probably cost about, you know, eight, eight and a half thousand euros per dose and you will need a dose every three weeks. And at that stage, we had just started fundraising. Um, so I had some money uh, and I just thought, well, you know, I, I, whatever money I have, I'll just keep, you know, fundraising and hope that I'll get to a stage where... Uh, um, you know, I'll have enough to keep going. I was willing to try anything, so that's kind of what we did. And, you know, by some miracle, really, in fairness to Dr. Fenley, he managed to convince the, the hospital board to, to allow me to, to take the drug. I think they have possibly multiple concerns or issues to deal with, but they certainly have the ethical issue to yes. deal with. And then they have presumably a concern about the hospital's own exposure should mm. uh, an unsuitable drug be given to somebody. Um, and of course, yeah, but, but I think probably the first and most important point is just from a, from a medical ethics point of view. Um, but you overcame those hurdles. I did. And you presumably then had to be tested to see if you were suitable for this drug. Exactly. So the next step then, once they approved this, now while we were trying to get the approval, I mm. was after having my tumour uh, tested, 
and I knew that I was a candidate. So I mean, that was what kind of cemented the argument, I suppose, in the end, you know, that um, Dr. Fenley was able to tell the hospital board that I had a, a test of over 55% um, and I was testing in the higher range, so between 65 and 75%, so that I would be a good candidate for this drug. And because there were very little curative options available to me, you know, that was kind of what made the argument in the end. And I suppose once the hospital were confident that I was going to be able to pay for this myself, they signed off on it. And when did you first get pembrolizumab? When was your first dose? 16th of April, 2018. Monday the 16th of April. So I, I remember it clearly, yeah, because I was really, really unwell at that point and I really knew that this was my last, my last hurrah, really. You know, I just thought, if this doesn't work, I'm on my way out. I knew it at that point. I was very, very ill by the uh, middle of April. I remember the day, the day before, actually, the day before I had the drug... Uh, that we went up to Dublin. We drove down home uh, to see my parents. It was my dad's birthday. The 15th of April is my dad's birthday. So we were going to have a family lunch. Um, and it was a lovely day, so they'd booked a lovely place out in um, Cheek, uh, Cheek Point Cheek called Point. Jack Mead's. Yep. Yeah. So they have a lovely kind of a beer garden out there, and it was a nice day. And we drove down. But I remember sleeping most of the way down, kind of in and out of consciousness almost. Uh, and I was drugged up at that stage. I was taking a lot of painkillers and my stomach was very distended. I looked like I was about eight months pregnant and I was wearing maternity clothes at that stage. Um, and I remember getting out of the car. My parents probably hadn't seen me at that point for about maybe two weeks. And I remember I d actually didn't get out of the car. Jim had to get out of the car and come over and help me out. That's how bad I was. He had to literally pull me out of the car. I, hadn't, I had no energy. Um, and I remember looking at everybody's faces because they were sitting at a height looking down at us. And all I remember is, you know that when you see people's faces and you just go, you know, the yeah. jaw dropping. Right. And I knew, I said, I remember saying to Jim, do I look that bad? And Jim couldn't lie, on, you know, fair play to him. He said, you do, Vicky, actually, you know. And God love him, he was living with this for, you know, two weeks on his own. And he was panicking, you know, really thought I was not going to make it. Um, and, you know, I didn't really stay long for that lunch. But I mean, that was the first day that I realised, oh God, you know, have I made a mistake? It was the first day I kind of questioned my decision about not taking the palliative chemotherapy because I was on no treatment at that stage, you know, nothing. And the following day, you you got pembrolizumab for the first time and about a week later or so, you were in the High Court uh, starting your trial. Yeah, absolutely. Um, what I remember from that first day uh, was the the case was, was opened um, Jeremy Marr, uh, your senior counsel, opened the case and then you were to be the first witness, as would be normal. But you were really very, very sick and yeah. you were in an awful lot of pain and the chair in the witness box that you would have to go up the steps to was a, a pretty hard uh, and uncomfortable yeah. chair. It's upholstered, but it's, you know, it's hard, kind of leathery sort of a thing. Um, and your aunt had yeah. to sit out of her wheelchair and I got the cushion from that, one of those medical cushions that you could comfortably sit on and we put mm. that up on the witness box. Um, it was pretty shocking, you know, to see uh, something. It doesn't sound like a big uh, step of preparation, you know, putting a cushion on a chair, but that doesn't happen uh, normally. And then you gave your evidence and it was very affecting on everybody who was in the room. But I think the sight of you, the, the clear, uh, grave health or ill health mm. that you were in, um, was probably even more affecting on, on everybody there. And there were quite a few people in that room who were upset at the yeah. end of your evidence. And uh, I remember the stenographer actually, because she was sitting right opposite me. That poor girl, I, I still remember what she looks like. All I can remember is she had mad curly hair and she was sitting right opposite me. I was looking straight at her mm. and she kept crying and she kept mouthing to me, you know, because uh, she, she was, the tears were literally running down her face and she just kept kind of going, so sorry, you know, like just mouthing it to me. And I tried not to look at her because she was upsetting me. You know, it was hard enough to be up there 
But I could understand where she was coming from, but I, I couldn't even look at her because then I was getting upset, you know. And thankfully for me, I suppose, with the layout of the courtroom, I couldn't see my parents or Jim or my best friends. They were sitting behind me. But I could hear my best friend, Maria, she's an awful softie, and I could hear her sniffling. And my aunt, who had given you the cushion, she's, again, she's another one, she's not able for this kind of stuff. And I could hear the two of them kind of sniffling, you know. Um, but thankfully, I couldn't see them. I think it was, if I, if I often think, you know, if, if I was able to see my parents and my family while I was giving evidence, I don't think I would have been able to do it as effectively because I would have gotten too upset, you know. So I was able to do it because I couldn't see them. I knew they were there, but um, because, as you know, some of the questioning was quite difficult, you know. Some of the questions were very hard to answer, particularly with my parents there. And, you know, yeah. so, yeah, it, yeah. Yeah. It's very personal stuff. And, you know, in some ways, mm. in some ways, it's it's unnecessary. It's an unnecessary intrusion. We, we did that to you because those were questions that were asked by your legal team. Mm. Um, the other side really handled you with relatively uh, kid gloves. And, mm. and that's typically the case in situations like this, because... They don't want to be um, gratuitous in their questioning of a person who is clearly an innocent in such a situation. Uh, whether fault is acknowledged is another matter, but either they were at fault or they weren't, which is the essence of a trial, but nobody could ever suggest that you were at fault in any way, no matter what the outcome of the case. Now, obviously, you successfully proved beyond um, I think any doubt with the experts that they were clearly at fault and as a consequence of that by the third day they were uh, now finally talking about terms of settlement but it was your own legal team who put all those questions to you and I, I sometimes wonder do we go too far in trying to bring out the extent of the harm in a case where there is really devastating harm you see there's a cap of mm. 500,000 euros on general damages for pain and suffering in a case. So if you have a person of, you know, a young person who is going to lose many years of their life as a consequence of a harm, that's enough. That's, that's maximum damages. So why even ask them anything else? Yeah. And yet there's this compulsion there to tell the story and it's ours, you know. It's, um, so I think hearing what you're saying and how difficult that was it's probably a conversation that we should have more with people in cases where you know the damages are going to be at the maximum level anyway mm. so perhaps the simplest thing to do is just to brush over these things now i don't think it was gone into in tremendous detail but even even addressing it is as you say very challenging when you're talking about the intimate things in your life in front of your parents yeah yeah, that was difficult for me. And I know it was one thing that Jim was certainly worried about talking about had he had to give evidence, you know. Um, that was one of the big things that he was, you know, very reluctant to have to uh, talk yeah. about, you know. Yeah. yeah, because you're very good at talking about um, very private matters. You're very good at talking about yeah. uh, the intimate things in your life. You're great at talking about sex directly, and dealing mm. with how this disease has affected you and how it affects other women but um, few enough people are and that would have been very hard I'm sure for Jim but he was he was lined up for the following day day four I think and yeah. the case settled at the end of day three and was then ruled on day four uh, which was that day when people probably first really heard about you yeah um, uh, just back to Pemberlizumab, um, yeah. that, that, that time around the trial, would that have been the low point or did things get worse than that? Did things get lower? No, it didn't get worse. It actually improved after that. That would have been probably yeah. the worst the worst part. Um, you were pretty sick after your first yeah. um, administration I of the drug. I was very drug, sick, you? yeah. Mm. Yeah, very sick. Um, we put in a horrendous you know, night here at home. When we came home, I got a very bad reaction to it. Um, I had really high temperature. I was hallucinating. I actually don't remember most of the night. Jim actually wanted to bring me to uh, to the hospital, and I said, "There's no point bringing me to Limerick Hospital. They won't know what to do." 
you know, there's a new drug. I said, I said, if you're going to go anywhere, we drive to Vincent's. I said, but look, let's just wait it out. Um, you know, I kind of said, just keep, keep giving me something to keep, bring my temperature down. And we managed to get through the night somehow. Um, and I improved, you know, I wasn't as bad the following day. I still had temperature and shivers and shakes. And, but, you know, after about two days, I felt almost normal again. And I think, you know, it was after the first week, really, I started to notice the difference, you know, that I, I had a little bit more energy. I didn't have as much, um, I wasn't as tired. And within two or three weeks, my stomach started to go down. So I knew it was working. You know, for me, it was a very physical thing. Uh, I, you know, my clothes were starting to get looser. I didn't have to wear the maternity trousers after about a month. So, you know, I, could, I knew it was working ever before the scan in, in June. And when you're getting it, uh, you're in a room in Vincent's. What does that look like mm. and, what, and, and how, is, how is the drug administered? So you're just in uh, the, the same room that I would have been in, uh, no, not in Limerick, but in, you know, you're in the same room that everybody goes to, whether you're having chemotherapy, immunotherapy, or whatever type of drug you're having. So you're in the chemotherapy ward, um, and there's about, it, the, the one in Vincent's is much nicer than the one in, uh, in Limerick where I had been previously. Uh, and it's a big, large room, kind of, and everything is, um, uh, you have separate beds with the curtain in between each bed. So there's about 12, maybe 12, 14 kind of, you know, beds in a row. Um, and what you do is you go up and you have your bloods done. First thing I have to do when I get up to the hospital is to have my bloods done um, first thing. So they always see where your bloods are at uh, and that always ma uh, determines whether or not you're going to have the, the drug that day. And that, that's the case for every patient who's having chemotherapy or immunotherapy. So once your bloods are good, as in you know, your hemoglobin count, your white cell count, all of that, then you know, once the blood results come back, then they um, authorise the drug then to be mixed um, because with pembrolizumab they only mix it on the day because it's so expensive they wait until they know you're definitely getting it before they make it in the lab so that takes about another hour and a half um, so most of my morning is spent having the bloods then going out for a coffee waiting for those to come back um, and then when the bloods come back they mix up the drug and then that takes another hour and a half so I go off and have lunch and then I come back and the actual administration of the drug only takes about a half an hour um, and it's intravenous. So when I started, obviously I was getting it intravenously in my arms, but now I have a, a port. So my um, my veins started failing really after, you know, mm. and I had only five when you think about it. It was from the chemotherapy, you know, my veins just were, were poor to start with anyway. They were, I, did, I don't have good veins. Um, so <laughs> after about, I think about six months on the pembrolizumab, you know, every time I went in to get a vein, you know, it took about half an hour or two different nurses to try and find a vein <laughs> you know and they were going for the smallest ones then down here which are really sore um to try and get needles in so eventually i i said look can i not just get a port in fitted so that it would be easier for administering and you know i'd be in and out faster so i've had that for the last you know 18 months i suppose that's still there that's a permanent yep. yeah 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 it's permanent well yeah they'll take it out eventually but yeah it's just in under the skin here a little bump and they just, uh, you know, locate the kind of the, the centre of it. And then they, um, you know, stick the needle in and we're away then. It's fine. But um, you may not know the answer to this, but I was just curious when you were saying that they mix the drug up in a laboratory mm. in the hospital. Do, do you know how, yeah. how that happens or how, how that works rather? Um, I asked actually about that mm. and they have to put it into a special machine. So they have to put it into some special machine that mixes it up. Um, mm. That's all I know. So and then that takes about an hour and a half. So, you know, you'd often see these machines. I've seen it on a couple of documentaries where you see they kind of, um, they're unusual. They kind of mix them at a certain speed or temperature or whatever. So it's a, it's a special machine anyway that makes this drug. Um, and it can only be administered as soon, once they know my bloods are good because okay. otherwise it's wasted and that's a lot of money obviously for and it's only a small bag the actual drug itself um, is 200 mils that's all I get you know when you think about it and is the the recipe as such is it the same for you as the next person yes it would be yeah right. it's the same yeah exactly the same yeah okay um, and then you receive you receive your administration of the drug and then what you just up you get and head home yeah and head home and I mean you know when I think of how my treatment was um, when I was on chemotherapy you know in 2014 and the last two and a half years on Pembro I mean I've 
driven myself up to the hospital on most occasions. Mm. Then I started taking the train before COVID. Um, so, you know, I travel myself and, you know, make my way to the hospital and go about my business. And I usually meet people, you know, friends for lunch while I'm up there, um, you know, and I make a nice day out of it. So, and it's not onerous, you know, and I drive home myself or get the train home and I'm not, you know, overly tired. So it, has, it hasn't been, it has never felt like um, an illness, you know, yeah. the la- really, you know, over the last oh, two you, and a half years. I've you, had a great have, quality of life. You'd have to say that over those two and a half years, you've, you've, led, the life, you've led the lives of about <laughs> 10 healthy women. Um, you've, uh, it, I was talking to Jim a little bit earlier, um, mm. your husband, and um, he, uh, he just said that things are never dull with Vicky, you know. <laughs> no, no, they're not. Uh, yeah. That there's always something going on was what was was his point. It's always something is going to happen or about to happen, and uh, yeah. yeah, you've been incredible. Um, and it, but it's wonderful, isn't it, to to have it is that gift of time. That's exactly what it is, Keen. You know, it's a gift. It really is a gift, and that's the way I've treated it for the last two and a half years. I think, to be honest, I've done more living in the two last two and a half years than I did in the previous ten. And that's why, you know, I jump at anything that comes to me, mm-hmm. you know, any offers of nice, you know, uh, experiences or opportunities. And, you know, we went to New Zealand for Christmas last year and I went paragliding. Um, you know, I'll try anything now at this stage of my life. And I think, you know, it's it's a pity that it took this illness and this situation for me to appreciate life, I suppose, and how important it is, uh, you know, and that's why I've done as much as I can, I suppose, over the last two and a half years while I've been well. Well, well, you're talking about the nice experiences, but what I think about when I think about how you've used this time is is a little bit different, and I think we should talk about it in more detail mm. in the next episode, but it's yeah. it's how you went on from you fighting to get pembrolizumab for you to you fighting to get it for other women, then extending it to a wider group again, not taking no for an answer from government for a whole host of things, um, then campaigning individually on behalf of a whole host of women who were also affected by failings in cervical check, then fighting the Department of Health to have them set up a support group for those people and their families, then fighting for a care package that was going to be provided for all of those people, and on and on and on. Mm. So, I mean, that's what you've done with your time. And yeah. it has been tireless. And I know you're not here to get, you know, uh, all sorts of praise heaped on you from me, but I think it's important that that be acknowledged. And at a time when time was known to be limited, mm. that you spent so much of it on others. And yeah. I think that that's the most remarkable thing so and as I said to you before perhaps in texts and private conversations you know that's that's what makes me most proud of you as a as another human being um, just to be part of the the same species <laughs> um, but having said all that I'm not going to give you the right of reply because you'll only say something <laughs> self-deprecating um, uh, at that uh, point I think we'll take another pause here in our uh, long and meandering conversations and well they're not meandering I mean we are moving in a something we are moving in a direction we are (laughs) hopefully otherwise people will will never pay attention to any of these Um, so uh, once again Vicky thank you very much for your time and I'll talk to you again soon thanks Keen. it was a lovely conversation out today thanks a million hi Vicky and I hope that you've enjoyed that episode and you're finding the series informative. If there's anything else that you'd like us to discuss or touch upon, please mention it in a comment below. And to be informed of future episodes, hit the subscribe button.